Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so today's screencast is going to focus on President Kennedy and uh, some of the major events that took place during Kennedy's presidency. So we're going to take a look at first how Kennedy became the president, uh, what he had to overcome to become the president, kind of some of the perception and the persona that he creates, uh, and then the major foreign policy events that take place during his presidency and kind of his approach to the Cold War. Just like we looked at Eisenhower's approach to the Cold War, we're going to take a look at Kennedy's approach to the Cold War. Now, I think interesting thing to start with is uh, how Kennedy becomes the president. So he has some things to overcome as a candidate. Uh, the main things being that uh, Kennedy is going to be our first uh, Catholic president. Uh, and so today you might not really seem like a big deal, the fact that Kennedy's background, his back, his religious background is Catholic. But in 1960, this is a really big deal. And so uh, Kennedy has to kind of overcome some anti Catholic rhetoric and different things of that nature. He's not the first Catholic candidate to run for president. We had a president, uh, presidential candidate named Al Smith, who was from New York, who ran for the presidency in 1928. Uh, he lost resoundingly, and he faced a lot of anti-Catholic rhetoric as well. So Kennedy has to kind of overcome that. Uh, he also has to overcome a little bit of his family's history and how his family got its wealth. Uh, so his family got a lot of its wealth through uh, bootlegging that uh, his, his father did during uh, the time of Prohibition. And so those kind of things do come up a little bit in his candidacy and uh, during his run for the presidency. Uh, but Kennedy has a lot of qualities that are very appealing to Americans. And he kind of walks to a situation that uh, is able to help him. So in the 1960s, television is kind of coming into its own. And so Kennedy is able to kind of use that new media to his advantage. Kennedy. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures of Kennedy, uh, he has kind of like these movie star good looks, and he's able to kind of use that. He's a very polished person, a very polished politician, and he's able to use this to his advantage. So it's very evident here in the first ever televised debates, the Kennedy-Nixon debates of 1960. Um, so I wasn't able to put the video into this screencast, but I'm going to provide the link below to you guys. I recommend you watch... I mean, you don't have to watch the whole debate. I'll watch like five, ten minutes of it. I want to see if you see what the American people saw. So Kennedy approaches the debates um, kind of like a movie star approach, getting ready for being on screen. He gets his makeup done. His hair is perfect. His suit is tailored. Everything's kind of perfect. Um, and Nixon really doesn't do that at all. He doesn't really get makeup done, doesn't get his suit perfectly pressed. Um, he's actually sweating profusely during the debate. Now, I bring all this stuff up because what's fascinating about the Kennedy-Nixon debates of 1960 is that those people that watch the debates on television believe that Kennedy wins the debates. And it largely has to do with the way he comes across, how polished he is, um, how well-spoken he is, how, how um, put together he looks um, due to his preparation. Interestingly enough, those people that did not watch the debates but listened to the debates on radio believe that Nixon wins the debates. So it brings up, I think, fascinating questions about like our presidential debates. You just watched presidential debates in the 2016 election. Uh, you know, what makes people, what makes a candidate appeal to somebody today? Is it all about the looks? Is it all about the persona that somebody brings across? I mean, Donald Trump was always trying to like throw in different zingers against candidates, throw them nicknames, interrupting people. Uh, was that what kind of appealed to people uh, during these debates? Or was it the substance of what they were saying? Uh, because in these 1960 debates, the substance says that Nixon won the debates, those, of who, those people who listened on the radio. Um, Kennedy ends up winning the election. So I think media plays a tremendous role in elections, in presidencies of today. We're into a new era now, right? We're talking about media as far as Twitter and um, social media accounts. TV is the first new foray into a different kind of media. You have the radio under FDR. Now television's making it smart. Now you're in the era where social media is playing a major role. Who knows kind of what the future is? And if you go even further back in American history to print uh, playing a major role in uh, who becomes a president and even kind of uh, in other aspects of American politics. But nevertheless, Kennedy's able to kind of use um, some of his ideas, um, some of his background, and some of his... Uh, you know, qualities in order to become the president. Now, when he becomes the president, there's really like a persona around Kennedy. 
that I think is important. Um, they'll refer to his White House, they'll call it Camelot, kind of referring to um, like King Arthur and, uh, you know, kind of like the, the myth surrounding that. Um, people are very interested in the Kennedys. Uh, he's young. Uh, his wife is young. He has young children. It's very appealing to people that, to have a president who's in his 40s and kind of, you know, not uh, an older statesman. Uh, and so people are get, kind of get like absorbed in this and they kind of get fascinated with the Kennedys. And I think that clouds a lot of people's opinions and um, evaluation of the Kennedys. So that's what we're going to try and do and evaluate Kennedy as a president. He's not the president for, for too long uh, because of the, the assassination that takes place. But uh, I think it's interesting to look at his policy. So that's what we're going to focus on with the rest of the screencast, looking at what did Kennedy do. And we're going to focus on foreign policy. A lot of Kennedy's ideas domestically we'll talk about on Monday and Tuesday. He's active in civil rights and kind of pushing for civil rights, but he never kind of sees this stuff to fruition because of the assassination. Now, foreign policy-wise, the Soviet Union kind of views Kennedy as potentially weaker than Eisenhower. And this is important to see the context here because um, they're going to try and test Kennedy. So remember, Eisenhower comes out with this massive retaliation theory. He's a military general. Um, comes from that background. They sense that Kennedy might be, he's younger, he may be more naive, um, maybe he's more easily testable in the world. And so they're going to kind of like push and see what can they um, essentially get away with in the world. Uh, and so the first major event, that, and I guess the foreign policy thing that really comes to dominate Kennedy's presidency is what's going on in Cuba. Now, Cuba is an important nation to the United States. It's only 90 miles south of Florida. So what goes on in Cuba essentially very much matters to the United States. Now, what is going on in Cuba uh, is a revolution. So in 1959, under Eisenhower's presidency, there's a, a revolution that takes place in Cuba. Uh, and essentially, uh, this guy, Castro, Fidel Castro, is going to overthrow the leader of Cuba, which is uh, Batista at the time. Now, Batista is a kind of a friendly regime to the United States, the dem democratic regime. Castro, on the other hand, uh, is a communist regime. So you have a communist revolution overthrowing a democracy in Cuba. Now, Americans, of course, are not happy about this. So I want you to think about two key pieces of legislation as to why Americans are not happy about the situation. I want you to think Monroe Doctrine, and I also want you to think Truman Doctrine, okay? Um, this is a potential threat very close by. You don't want communism to spread, and you don't want communism spreading 90 miles off the coast of your own country. It's right in the backyard of the United States, okay? Uh, and the United States is not happy about this situation. Uh, but the way that they go about trying to deal with it once the communist revolution happens, causes all kinds of controversy for Kennedy early on in his presidency. So this becomes known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. So Kennedy is not willing to go to war to kind of try and remove Castro from power and remove the communist regime from power. But he does give uh, the green light to a covert CIA operation known as the Bay of Pigs. So you have a lot of pro-Batista people who are going to flee Cuba when Castro comes into power. Uh, the CIA is going to kind of team up with these guys. Uh, and what their idea is, is to kind of uh, bring these Cuban nationals back to Cuba uh, with support of the CIA and then supposedly going to be the support of the U.S. military to a certain extent. Uh, and essentially what these guys were supposed to do was to start an ins a popular insurrection up against the Castro regime. Uh, and re-overthrow and reinstitute a democracy in Cuba. Now, it's a complete disaster. Uh, what ends up happening is that um, these guys are captured, you know, they're put in jail, and very soon comes out, and Cuba knows, and the Soviet Union knows, that the United States is behind this attempted overthrow of Cuba. Now, this leads us to very tense moments uh, in the Cold War. This, first of all, um, is a major diplomatic crisis uh, for the United States because Kennedy has to kind of then speak to this and try and, um, you know, smooth this over in, in the world sphere as we're trying to cause insurrection in a foreign country. Uh, but what it's going to lead to eventually in 1962 is the Cuban Missile Crisis. So what occurs here 
is you have Cuba, like I said, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Now, Cuba now and the Soviet Union now have reason to feel threatened from the United States because we've already tried through a CIA operative, the Bay of Pigs, to remove this communist regime that came to power in Cuba. Cuba, we don't know if Cuba asks for it or the Soviet Union uses this situation as a way to get closer to the United States and to put a threat into the United States. But in any event, what ends up happening is that the Soviet Union is going to place nuclear missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba. Now, this becomes kind of a scary event and a, and a crisis mode for the Kennedy administration, a crisis mode for the United States. The United States, through spying, um, through kind of like flying uh, spy airplanes over Cuba, finds the missile sites. And this becomes a huge, huge crisis for about 10 or so, 10 to 15 days or so. Um, what they find out is that there's multiple missile sites, you know, in Cuba that have ranges that can hit many major U.S. cities, you know, including Washington, D.C., New York, all different major cities within the United States. And this kind of ratches up the tension of the Cold War tremendously. Uh, and, you know, Americans, once they find out about this, are incredibly nervous, incredibly concerned. Uh, at this time, the Soviet Union and the United States are not really speaking because of, uh, you know, difficult situations and uh, tense moments around the world. And so there's a real fear here that maybe the United States and Cuba will actually go to war over these missiles. So it's a major crisis for the Kennedy administration. How are they going to deal with the situation? What are they going to do? Are they going to threaten uh, the Soviet Union? Are they going to try and threaten Cuba and the Soviet Union to, to remove these weapons? Are they going to try and negotiate it out? What are they going to do? So with Kennedy, he's relying on some of his major foreign, and made some of his major advisors. So the two big advisors you're going to have here are Robert Kennedy and Dean Acheson, which are, you know, kind of part of his cabinet and his inner circle at the time. Uh, and essentially, there's a couple of different ideas being floated out there. First one is to prepare for an invasion of Cuba to physically remove the weapons. Um, so that's one idea out there. Send troops down to Florida, get them ready to invade Cuba and physically remove the weapons. Second idea being floated out there is to put a quarantine around Cuba and try and cut them off from, you know, the rest of the world, international trade, uh, and try and use that kind of pressure to get them to remove the weapons. Third idea being floated out there is that this is the time to use atomic weapons, um, to blow up the missile sites before... They can potentially use them on the United States. So that's being thrown out there. Four, you could try and negotiate with the Soviet Union. You could call them up, try and figure out a way to come to some kind of solution between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union. Now, ultimately, what they do is they do a combination of a lot of different things. Um, they are going to send troops down to Florida and get them ready to invade Cuba. And at the same time, what they do is they're going to put up a quarantine um, blockade around Cuba. And then they negotiate with the Soviet Union. They talk to the Soviet Union. Uh, so it's a very, very tense couple of days, uh, about 10, 10 to 15 days there, you know, in 1962. Americans are concerned that this is it. This is the nuclear war they've, they've been told about, you know, doing fallout drills and building fallout shelters in their backyard. This is, they're scared that this is going to be the start of it. Now, Kennedy is able to um, through some good diplomatic relations, able to masterfully end this crisis and not have to go to war with the Soviet Union or with Cuba. Eventually what's going to happen is that, you know, they're going to get these weapons removed uh, and essentially get the Soviet Union to back down. Now, later on, a couple months later, kind of through the secret negotiations, we agreed to remove some weapons that are very close to the Soviet Union, which is in Turkey. And that's kind of a part of how we're able to, to move through this crisis. Uh, but it's an interesting and scary time period for Americans. And this is the major event, Cold War event, of Kennedy's presidency. So big things you want to think about, how does it relate to the Truman Doctrine, how does it relate to the Monroe Doctrine, and to the change or continuity from Eisenhower's presidency. All right, guys, I will see you on Monday. Have a good rest of your weekend.